Thanks to everyone for, uh, for being here, to uh, Sarah for arranging all of this and the sponsorship as well of the Center for Security Policy, uh, as well as Emet. Um, I want to build on what um, Mark and, uh, and uh, Dr. Ferris have just um, explained uh, and, and begun with the geographical overview of the region and then the historical and the, 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 um, the uh, overview, if you will, of, of the Iranian regime and, uh, and its purpose and its intent. Um, and give you some specifics about what the Iranian regime actually is doing in terms of its nuclear weapons program, its missiles, uh, and uh, the development of those. Let's take as our starting point um, the election of, um, well, selection of uh, the new Iranian president, Hassan Rouhani, uh, who took office in the middle of the last year, August 2013, um, billed as a moderate uh, a reformer by uh, those with um, rose-colored glasses and stars in their eyes. Um, this individual, in fact, is a long-term insider of the regime. Uh, he, in fact, is, uh, you, you see on the right side of the slide, there was a member of Iran's National Security Council when they took the decision, when that group, the council, took the decision in the early 1990s, as um, Dr. Ferris referred uh, to the attacks in Buenos Aires in Argentina in 1992 and 94. He was part of the decision-making process for those two terrorist attacks. Um, but I also want to note at the bottom there that the final decision maker in the Iranian regime is the supreme leader Khamenei, and of course before him it was Khomeini. He is the commander, that's why he has the name uh, supreme leader. Now the talks between the United States and Iran about the uh, joint plan of action, if you will call it that, um, that was discussed in Geneva in November, the discussions continuing now. Those talks began in secret uh, a long, long time ago, uh, as far back as March of 2013. And in fact, contacts between the Obama administration and the Iranian regime go back much, much further than that. But these particular discussions about the nuclear program early part spring of last year. Israel, by the way, completely left out of these talks, found out from the Saudis. Prime Minister Netanyahu, when he did find out about these talks, urged the P5 plus one, that means the permanent five of the uh, United Nations Security Council, um, United States, Britain, uh, Russia, China, and, and France, uh, the plus one being Germany. That negotiating group urged them against um, this deal, against uh, being sucked into these talks, but he was ignored and marginalized by all of the above. Here is a brief overview of those talks and what the um, so-called joint plan of action statement uh, of late November, um, uh, what that entails. Uh, the agreement announced on the 23rd of November um, principally offer uh, Iran sanctions relief uh, but in return for that, really, there's nothing else given in return. Um, it is to be an interim agreement, which, by the way, is not finalized yet, even now. It's not finalized. It's not, uh, the clock hasn't started ticking on this agreement at all. But it's to be a six-month interim agreement, as they call it. Enrichment, as the Iranians have said, is explicitly permitted and envisioned, not just for the six-month interim agreement, but permanently, and I have the text of the, of the statement in the agreement right here. I'm not doing very well here. Um, good. Um, and I have the text which, which confirms the fact that uh, enrichment is to be permitted, not just the interim agreement, but long term. Not only that, but Iran gets to keep uh, all of its centrifuges, which are more than 19,000 at this point. Among those, the very advanced, the faster uh, what they call the IR2 models of enrichment, uh, of, of centrifuges. They also get to keep their entire stockpile of enriched uranium now up to 20%, although half of that is supposed to be diluted to a, a level uh, less readily uh, converted to weapons grade uranium. Uh, move it on down, their 3.5% stockpile, which amounts to about six or 7,000 kilos at this point in time is enough right now with further enrichment 
to make four bombs, nuclear weapons. Uh, we have no idea if they've done that yet or not. We have no clue, none. But they get to keep this under the arrangement in any case. Uh, the IAEA inspectors, International Atomic Energy Inspectors, um, are uh, not going to be able to go to all of the Iranian nuclear sites that I'm going to talk about here in a bit. Um, they apparently will go and have been uh, at Natanz, the primary enrichment site. Uh, perhaps they will go to Fordow, maybe to Arak, the uh, plutonium parallel program uh, enrich our uh, uh, heavy water reactor site. They're not going to visit Khondab, they're not going to visit the Quds site, they're not going to visit Parchin or any of the other clandestine sites that I don't even know the names of. Why is this guy so happy? Well, this is Javad Zarif, and he just rolled the entire P5 plus one, including the United Nations um, uh, IAEA negotiating team and the United States. Of course he's happy. He formerly was Iran's uh, United Nations ambassador from 2002 to 2007 in New York, named foreign minister of the new uh, Hassan Rouhani regime in August of last year. He has been the key uh, Iranian nuclear negotiator for these talks. He openly in the past has boasted about using the negotiation process to advance Iran's nuclear program. Of course he's happy. So what do they really want? Well, to listen to the statements from both sides, the United States side and the Iranian side, President Obama says uh, very cheerily, for the first time in nearly a decade, we have halted progress on the Iranian nuclear program. Well, not so much. Um, Javad Zarif, on the other hand, says, it's an opportunity to end an unnecessary crisis. What crisis? Well, the sanctions. They get sanctions relief out of this. The United States, the other P5 members, and Germany plus one do not get much of anything. The talks are proceeding. We understand now, most recently, that the ex expert level technical talks are going to advance to the deputy minister level later this month, and uh, that a, uh, an agreement on a timetable for the implementation of the agreement might be possible by the end of this month, January 2014. Meanwhile, there is a lot of orchestrated theater going on in Tehran. Uh, while the Supreme Leader, Khamenei, supports the joint statement and this, the framework of this agreement, of course, why wouldn't he? All the advantages it gives Iran. Uh, the Majlis, which is the Iranian parliament, uh, has a number of representatives in it which are protesting loudly that the terms of this agreement are not to Iran's benefit. Uh, there is a hardliner versus a moderate debate going on. This is theater. This is kabuki. All right, there is another statement we ought to pay more attention to, and this was made in the middle of December by a former advisor to the former Iranian President Khatami, uh, Mohammad Sadek al Husseini, who spoke on Syrian news TV and said, This is the Treaty of Hudabiya in Geneva. All right, what's the Treaty of Hudabiya, you might ask? Well, back in Islamic history, in the early days of the Muslims, Mohammed. Uh, already uh, had control of the city of Medina, but his forces weren't strong enough to take Mecca, which was his next target. This is the year 628, and he therefore agreed to a 10-year truce with a pagan tribe called the Quraysh uh, that controlled Mecca at the time. Well, two years later, he now has 10,000 fighters under his command, so Muhammad broke the treaty and marched into Mecca. That is the treaty and the lesson of Hudabiya. The point of it is, from the history of, of the Muslims and from Muhammad himself, war is deceit. That is a direct quote from Hadith by Bukhari. Also another Hadith, these are sayings of Muhammad, recorded uh, to be sayings of Muhammad. Also from Bukhari, by Allah and Allah willing, if I take an oath and later find something else better than that, that I do what is better and expiate my oath. Sharia, Islamic law says more, it's better to avoid ceasefires if you can because they entail the non-performance of jihad, but if necessary, follow the example of Muhammad. And they do, and the Iranians are. All right, quickly, just a quick overview of what the Iranian motivation is as Dr. Fair has outlined, this goes back to the beginning of the revolution. It goes back to the Ayatollah Khomeini 
and what he envisioned for Iran and the future of Iran. His vision was not just a revolution in Iran, precisely as Dr. Ferris said, it was to spread revolution by jihad to impose Sharia regionally, globally, as far as they possibly can. Other objectives of this regime have been consistent. The geostrategic domination of the Persian Gulf and the broader Middle East and even Southwest Asia uh, geographic region, as you can see in Mark's maps, to confront the United States and Israel globally, not just regionally, and as well to seize the ideological leadership of the international jihad movement. Let's talk about the Iranian constitution very quickly and the nature of the regime that is visible through that constitution. These are quotes from it. It talks about Islamic principles and rules. This is what the Iranian regime will be guided by. It's in their constitution. Vilayet-i Fahri. Vilayet-i Fahri is, a, is a, a Farsi Persian phrase that means the rule of the religious guardian or the rule of the jurisprudent. That means the supreme leader. First Khomeini, now Khomeini. It means that that jurist, that clerical leader of the Iranian regime has power both over the religious hierarchy uh, as well as political power combined in one. The Iranian regime, according to its constitution, again quoting from it, is to continue both inside and outside the country. That's what their constitution says. It also says, prepare the way towards a united single world community. What does that mean in Islamic terms? It means an imamate in Shiite terms or a caliphate in Sunni terms. All right. The constitutional role of the IRGC, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, is outlined in the Constitution as well. It says very explicitly that IRGC has responsibility for, quote, a religious mission which is jihad. And it quotes from the Quran in that Constitution. It says, quoting the Quranic verse from Surah 8, verse 60, against them make ready your strength to the utmost of your power, including steeds of war to strike terror into the hearts of the enemies, your enemies whom you doth know and others whom you do not know, but Allah doth know. That's the full verse. Here is the motto, here is the um, logo and the commander of the IRGC, that is General uh, Jafari. Just as Dr. Ferris spoke of when Khomeini, in the midst of the Iran-Iraq war in the middle of the 1980s, faced a situation in which he did not know that his military could not be certain that they would win, against Saddam, uh, Saddam Hussein. This is what Khomeini said. He wrote it in a letter and a command to his military, to the IRGC. Focus on the middle part there that is highlighted in red. That we must have, we, the Iranians, our regime, must have the ability to create noticeable quantities of laser and atomic weapons. Mm -hmm. This was his command to his IRGC, which to this day retains control and command of Iran's, all of Iran's uh, WMD, weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear, plus the missile delivery systems. That was Khomeini's command. It has never been revoked. And Khomeini, the successor to Khomeini, continues that mission. Most of the world did not know about Iran's covert clandestine nuclear weapons program for a long time after that 1988 beginning. The Iranians, by the way, went to the Pakistanis to AQ Khan to get the first elements of that program, um, both blueprints and also for warheads and also parts to make um, centrifuges. But in 2002, the Iranian opposition group, the Mujahideen Khalq, revealed that program publicly, for the first time publicly to the world, in simultaneous uh, press conferences in Paris and Washington, D.C. Those revelations talked about uh, sites secret sites that heretofore ha or theretofore had not been made public in which Iran was developing a nuclear weapons capability. What are some of those sites? Well, here's a picture of Natanz satellite photo. It's on the internet, um, exposed in 2002. Uh, you see it under construction here. You see those red outlined places. Well, they eventually wound up underground. You see it here completed with everything underground, the dirt covering over everything now, those centrifuge halls where they have those 19,000 and plus centrifuges whirling away, totally underground, protected. Now, uh, at the current time, with those 19,000 centrifuges at Natanz and who knows where else, other sites, 
that we may not yet know about. According to a recent estimate by the, uh, the ISIS, ISIS, International Science and International Strategic, I might be getting those words wrong, I'm sorry if, I, if I've got it wrong, but estimates David Albright's group, ISIS, does excellent analysis um, that Iran currently with what it has on hand and its capabilities can make enough weapons grade uranium for one bomb in mere weeks. That is called the breakout scenario or the breakout time frame. Enough low enriched uranium on hand, we talked about that earlier, uh, for approximately four to five nuclear bombs right now. Here's a picture of Isfahan. This is the place where they convert the raw uranium ore, or actually the yellow cake from it, uh, to the gas that gets fed into the centrifuges at Natanz. Here is an overview of the Arak Heavy Water Facility. This is their parallel pathway to get a bomb. It is the plutonium pathway um, that uses a heavy water reactor to do that, also exposed by the uh, Iranian opposition group back in the early 2000s. Here is an overview of what was called the Lavizan Xi'an site, exposed in May 2003 by that opposition group. They were researching both biological weapons and nuclear weapons here at this site. What happened after the revolutions, the, uh, the regime went to panic stations, of course, all of this is now in the public domain, and they decided, uh, as for Lia, uh, Lavizan Xi'an, that they were going to destroy it. And so you can see in this oversight photo, they completely raised the place to the ground, they cut every tree, every bush, they pulled up every blade of grass, and they scraped the earth down to, I don't know what, six centimeters or whatever it was, carted the dirt off someplace, and they turned the place into a city park and said the municipality of Tehran really wanted this site for uh, picnic tables and tennis courts and so forth, and they thought they should give it to them. Wasn't that nice? So there is the new overview of the place. However, that was not the end of the Iranian nuclear program, no. The pieces and parts and components that were at Lavizan Xi'an were taken elsewhere and uh, were dispersed, and they were placed and hidden in more secure underground, uh, under mountains, bunkers, tunnels, and so forth. Uh, to, to hide them and make them more secure. Uh, the IAEA itself reports that Iran um, is, is not only relocating these things, but blocking the IAEA from investigating and visiting. Not only then all these revelation, revelations in the early 2000s from the Iranian opposition group, but the revelations keep coming. And some of it is uh, able to be seen on satellite overhead photos like this one, uh, discovered in 2007. This is what is called the Colm site or sometimes the Fordow site. It's another enrichment site. It's got about 3,000 uh, centrifuges inside of that facility, which may or may not have suffered uh, a catastrophic explosion about one year ago. The revelation came out uh, in 2009. By this, by, by last year, really, they had around, as I said, 3,000 centrifuges whirling away there. The IAEA has not visited there since late December 2012. We have no idea exactly what's going on at Fordow, nor assurances uh, that the IAEA will be able to visit there uh, anytime soon. Parchin, another site, you see it in oversight, uh, satellite overview here. Um, it is a military site. It is a place where the IAEA, IAEA believes that Iran conducted um, explosive tests on the triggers that set off a nuclear weapon. Well, once that got exposed, uh, we see a repeat, it seems, of what they did at Lavizan Shia. Remember, raise the place to the ground. Uh, IAEA has been uh, denied access to this place, even though they've requested it repeatedly. And instead, what they're doing, and which is visible on overhead satellite photography, like you see here, um, is that they have raised a number of buildings to the ground at this site, and you can see. Uh, or at least satellite experts can see in the dirt uh, the imprint of heavy earth-moving equipment that has been scraping the ground at Parchin as well. Another place that we found out about from uh, uh, Reza Khalili, uh, one of our colleagues who does such excellent work, former IRGC uh, uh, member himself, formerly then went to work uh, for the CIA as an agent, a reporting agent, uh, he was the recipient of um, uh, the, uh, the Emet um, uh, Award this past year. In any case, 
Uh, he's the author of A Time to Betray His Life Story, but he has re revealed a number of sites thanks to the ongoing connections he has with the IRGC, former colleagues, very dangerous connections. But he revealed Khondab. Khondab uh, is another enrichment plant, one of supposedly seven, perhaps more, that Iran is still, to this date, developing right now. It's a three-level site built under a mountain. Uh, it's around 80 miles from the Fordow site. Uh, and there are reportedly Russians and North Koreans working in this site. According to Reza, there are something like 2,000 gas centrifuges whirling away in this facility. Here are some oversight uh, views, satellite views of the site, including the uh, uh, entrances uh, in, the, in the mountain that, that then go down into the site underground, deep underground. The IAEA um, has been reporting uh, much more openly in the past few years than prior to that, uh, talks about uh, the Iran program weaponizing. They use these words, weaponizing. They cite the, the input of foreign expertise. They talk about warhead detonator and explosive tests like we mentioned at Parchin. Um, more recently, in, in the reports that come out quarterly, uh, in English, you can find them online, no agreement with Iran, major differences, deep and concerning, increasing concern about the military dimensions of the Iranian nuclear program. Um, currently, more than 15,000 centrifuges, and that's just the ones we know about. The Secretary General of the IAEA, Yukia Amano, says, uh, this was just a quote very recently, uh, re regarding the nego negotiations going on, proof of the pudding is in the eating. All right, one last aspect that I want to bring to you very quickly is what uh, Dr. Ferris referred to, and that is the missile testing and the missile ICBM, intercontinental missile development, that Iran continues to pursue, uh, and of course, closely, in close um, coordination with North Korea. Die Welt, German publication, um, reported in 2010 that North Korea as well was conducting nuclear tests for Iran, and that a couple of its nuclear tests done in North Korea were in fact on behalf of Iran, so that Iran was not doing it on its own territory. Uh, this is where um, our concern about the development of something called a super EMP, as Dr. Ferris referred to it, EMP, electromagnetic pulse weapon, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it was Mark, I'm sorry, Mark, Mark is the one who referred to this very dangerous, very um, concerning development. Electromagnetic pulse is a small kiloton yield, small explosive yield, high gamma ray output nuclear device exploded in the high atmosphere that kills no one on the ground immediately, but destroys everything electronic, anything that runs on a computer chip, meaning our entire modern 21st century lifestyle that runs on electricity. North Korea is developing these, most likely in coordination with Iran. The data on some of those recent um, tests that North Korea conducted um, showed signature isotopes and other features that point to the fact that this is very likely uh, an EMP development program. By the way, the results of an EMP detonated over the United States, let's say in the middle of the country, Kansas or something, uh, is no deaths immediately, no buildings are destroyed immediately, but because everything electronic goes down, communications, transportation, water, electricity, you name it, et cetera, fuel delivery, food delivery, within one year, there are estimates nine out of 10 Americans would be dead. Dead of starvation, dead of lack of medical care, dead of civil war that would break out of the remaining resources left in the country. The Joint Missile Development Program with, the, uh, with North Korea uh, uh, is based on the SCUD program that North Korea got from, from Russia originally. Uh, the Iranian missiles are the Shahab-3s. Um, they have uh, a lot of uh, advancements in, in recent years, including stages. They have developed a multi-stage missile. They have also developed the use of solid rocket propellant fuel, which means that the rocket can be, or the, the missile can be um, kept underground or hidden until the last moment. Uh, it doesn't have to spend a long time out on a launch pad visible to overhead or satellite imagery. Uh, while it fuels up with li liquid fuel. Here are just some of the uh, images of some of the, uh, the missiles currently in its arsenal. And if you look at the maps um, and the, the, the circumference of the range 
that these missiles currently and, and, and shortly projected to be able to reach, again, just as Mark said, all the way to Russia. Uh, it's not just Russia. They are not just trying, by the way, as you can see, to hit Israel. There is no need for missiles with a 1,500, 2,000 kilometer range to reach Israel or even, by the way, to reach United States forces based in the Middle East Persian Gulf region. They've got that covered long time since. No, the Pentagon itself in open source reporting now has said that by 2015, okay, that's next year, the Iranian ICBM program will have the capability to reach continental United States of America from Iran. All right, finally, um, why, why don't American national security leadership understand and, and react to all of this, you know, the way we would expect them to, with alarm and with resolve to counter it? Well, part of the reason for that may be, just might be, what is called, even in the Iranian media press itself, the Iran lobby. They call it that themselves, the Iran lobby dar America, they say. And if there is anyone who is at the center of the Iran lobby uh, in the United States, the network, it is this gentleman on the slide here. His name is Trita Parsi. He's the founder and president of the National Iranian American Council. He has been a consistent voice uh, promoting the Iranian agenda that would be lessen uh, the sanctions, ease the sanctions, uh, release the blocked funds, uh, take a military response off the table, that agenda consistent voice for that on Capitol Hill in offices right here in this building and other buildings here on Capitol Hill. He authored a piece in the middle of December in the Huffington Post called Which Iran Will We Choose, which was full of laudatory praise for uh, uh, President Rouhani, talking about him as a moderate, that the negotiations in Geneva could be a win-win proposition for everybody, pieces around the corner if we just make accommodations to uh, Tehran's demands. Okay, let me conclude here quickly with um, an assessment or a look at what, what is their real purpose. You know, they, the leadership in Iran frequently resorts to what we would call bluster and bravado. They make statements very often that sound totally over the top. Well, we could maybe dismiss them as over the top if we hadn't seen what I just showed you, all the actual capabilities being developed that would actually be able, uh, enable them to carry out these threats that they, they fling out there with such regularity. Well, here's one from a few years ago. Um, Kehan is a, is a government-controlled, it's, it's, it is considered a, a government-controlled out, media outlet in Iran, and uh, says, if the United States strikes Iran with nuclear weapons, there are elements which will respond with nuclear blasts in the centers of Americans, America's main cities, uh, here is the commander of all of the Iranian armed forces. He is Major General Hassan Firuz Abadi, and he is the chief of staff, something like the uh, commander of uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the United States. And he says the Iranian nation is standing for its cause, which is the full annihilation of Israel. And then finally, most recently, we have an Iranian Majlis member. Again, that's their parliament speaking openly in the parliament in Iran, we are not looking for a nuclear bomb, but having a nuclear bomb, he said, is necessary to put down Israel. Openly speaking these things in the Iranian parliament. Not a single leader in America's national security leadership noticed this, spoke about it, highlighted it, or said a word about it. Final slide, uh, the question, and we have to leave this one open, are they rational? If the definition of rational is values the survival of the nation and the people of Iran more highly than any other value or set of values, are they rational? Or would they sacrifice their own people and their own country? As Khomeini, the original Ayatollah Khomeini said, let this land burn, I say, let this land go up in flames if Iran, uh, I'm sorry, if Islam uh, is uh, triumphant in the world. 